Shamta Chaudhary, and I'm just delighted that Julia Phillips has joined me today to talk about her debut novel, Disappearing Earth, which is out now in paperback. Julia, welcome. Thank you. It's so nice to finally meet you over Zoom, but it feels like face-to-face. -face. I'm so glad that we're connecting. Yes, me too. We've had a lot of deferred conversations because we were supposed to meet at various book festivals. But hey, if we can't go to the festivals, we bring the festivals to us. Yes, the festivals into our living rooms and our homes. Very right. nice. So I just wanted to say that you've had the kind of literary debut that every writer dreams of. You know, you've had critical acclaim scattered like confetti. The um, New York Times called it superb, um, engrossing, says Entertainment Weekly, stunning NPR, addictive, cosmopolitan. And, you know, I won't send myself into depression by reading any more superlatives. But of course, you found a very wide and very appreciative audience. So for those of you who haven't yet read the book, it starts out with the abduction of um, two young sisters. And their mysterious disappearance sets off reverberations throughout their community in the Russian peninsula of Kamchatka. So Julia, Tell us what made you hit on this as the instigating action for the novel. Oh, that's a good question. I, I am a big fan of thrillers, certainly, and a big fan of mysteries. Those are two things I really love to read and really love to follow in fiction. And it overlaps a lot, I find, with an appetite in myself for um, true crime, for stories of violence against women and girls, for um, what, you know, growing up for me was often like this sensationalized, repeated trope of um, young white girls in peril or young white girls in danger. I watched a lot of Law and Order SVU. I read a lot of fairy tales about princesses in peril. I um, read a lot of tabloids about you know, beauty queens hurt. And I think after a, a while of consuming these stories, we start to wonder what is the appetite here? What, what are these cultural tropes um, tr communicating to us? And, and why, why am I taking them so to heart? Why am I clinging to them? And, and I wanted to write this book in a way to explore that, um, appetite in myself and and to create a mystery that both kind of scratched the itch for the mystery that I'd grown up loving and also um, broke it open a little bit for myself so I could better understand what it was all about. Yeah, this, this disappearance, this mysterious um, vanishing of young children, particularly girls, sort of strikes this primal frisson of terror. You know, I'm thinking of um, Ian McEwan's book, um, mm -hmm. The Child in Time, where this mm -hmm. little girl is abducted from a um, supermarket and her father just obsessively dwells on that moment. Is there some little thing he could remember, something he could see out of the corner of his eye that would change the outcome of what happened? And um, I think that, that sort of you've tapped into something that we all feel immediately viscerally con connected to. You know, apart from the story itself, one of the things that's most compelling about the book is its setting. And now that so many of us are experiencing isolation firsthand, being cut off from the world, Kamchatka, which has no roads leading anywhere, connecting it to the rest of the world, suddenly doesn't seem so remote. So um, tell me how, how you um, settled upon Kamchatka as a setting, a backdrop, actually even a character in the story, and also how you feel it heightens what you were trying to do with the narrative. Yeah, I, I came to Kamchatka because I was a Russophile. I studied 
um, Russian language in college and studied in Russia and was really fascinated in, with Russia, um, Russian literature, Russian history. But I had always wanted to be a novelist and I couldn't quite figure out how to combine these two interests in studying Russian language and studying creative writing. And so I thought, okay, the best thing to do is gonna to be to set a novel in Russia and then I can move to the country and continue my language studies um, and continue to learn and work on my craft as well. Um, so I started hunting around for a setting. And when I learned about Kamchatka, I learned more about Kamchatka, I thought this is such a, a fantastic place to set the kind of stories that I love to read. Um, if, if I love a mystery, like there is a, this is a fascinating, fascinating place to put one because Kamchatka, um, as you said, has no roads connecting it to the mainland. It's, it's very far east in Russia. So it's in the Bering Strait. If you picture the tail of Alaska swinging out, it swings into the Kamchatka Peninsula. And it was a closed territory for almost all of the 20th century. It was a strategic Soviet military territory. So no foreigners were allowed to go there and even Russians needed special permission to visit. So it's only been open to visitors for about 30 years now, and it is still quite isolated and um, very difficult to get to in terms of, uh, it doesn't have you know, robust infrastructure that makes it very easy to access. Um, and there are some qualities that it has because of its unique history and geographic situation and, and natural landscape that make it um, particularly compelling to me. I, it has, it's an enormous territory. It's about the size of California and almost all of its population is concentrated into one city. Um, so it's like, it's like all of California, but with the population of St. Louis, you know, St. Louis is the only city in there. And, um, and that, those enormous distances that, that creates between kind of settled points and the, the challenge of getting from one point to another, um, the sort of natural visual drama of the landscape of this volcanic peninsula, all of those things seem to me like uh, qualities that would make a, a story set there particularly compelling. Yeah, and you know, um, despite the fact that it is this rugged, volcanic, um, forested landscape, in a sense, it also feels like um, a closed in, you know, the mystery set in a closed in library or, or one of those mysteries where nobody can get off the island. Yeah. It, it plays into that. That um, makes me happy. It has a very island feel to it, I think. A peninsula that feels like an island, certainly. Yeah, because to the north, there's nobody can can access the north really through the terrain. Um, you know, the, the way this abduction uh, ripples outwards, this is like the stone cast in the center of the water and it ripples outward into other stories of violence and loss and harm that other women have experienced. And I find that you said it's the um, which stories are privileged. It's the um, young, um, typical um, girls who are who suck all the oxygen out of the news. But there's also an indigenous uh, girl who disappeared. So I want you to talk about how by juxtaposing this disappearance with other um, threats to women. What 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 were you trying to achieve in a larger way with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, everything you're saying makes me so happy because I'm like, oh, that's just what I would hope that someone would feel from the book. Um, I, so much of writing for me is, is trying to understand how the world works or, or how um, life is. And, and when I think about the structure of this book, it came very much out of, um, ideas and experience and and a kind of way of seeing the world that I had um, and that the people around me seemed to have but that I didn't see reflected in media very often that that 
often when I was presented with a story of violence, um, either uh, in fact or in fiction, it, that story was really tightly focused on um, a victim, a perpetrator, and a detective, maybe. Um, and, and an investigation would seem to be driven by only one person or a, um, or what happened that led to a crime would also be seen as driven only by one person's sort of dastardly actions. Um, it seems to me or that, that the way we live is, is not reflective of that, that in fact there are so many people who participate and create and are culpable in a culture of harm, um, of violence, of belittling, of oppression, that then makes possible quite visible um, or highly publicized violences. And that all of those, you know, in, in the beginning of this book, there is the abduction of children by a stranger, which is so, so unusual, like really statistically so unlikely. And yet something like that, as you say, sucks a lot of the air out of the room. It, it, it is highly publicized and that publicity rests on and the act itself rests on a foundation of, um, of harms that we all participate in in our daily lives. And in the same way that we all sort of take part in hurting each other and teaching each other who it's permissible to hurt and who if you hurt, you'll get a lot of attention for and who if you hurt, no one will even talk about it and you can keep on doing it over and over again and it is totally um, in a, seen as, as normal and fine. Um, we can also come together to help each other and we can um, act as a community to do better and to hold people accountable and to address um, and break apart that, that foundation that makes such, such pain persist. I, I really wanted, when I looked, in looking at these two missing girls who start off the book, it seemed impossible to just look at them in isolation and not look at all the world of violence around them, especially in this story um, a very, very similar case of another young woman who was not treated as the perfect victim that the girls are, who was treated very differently because of her ethnicity, because of her class, um, because of her age, that, that she was given none of the attention. She wasn't even called a victim. She was not even sort of recognized as someone who had been hurt. That's absolutely true. You know, I think about um, Tommy Orange's book, There, There, and the violence against um, Native women and how um, people are not even aware of it. And I'm ashamed to say that I was not aware of it till I read the book and then it, you can't escape uh, knowledge of it after that. And it's almost, um, it's such a convenient trope to hand these poor innocent little girls whom you read about. Um, Aliona and so Sophia are getting into the car and your heart goes pit a pat. But with Lydia, it's more of a sense, well, she, she must have been asking for it. You know, that becomes the default for those who don't fit into the picture perfect victim. So what I wanted to ask you next is there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of menace, Let, let's not say violence, but menace out there in the world of Kamchatka, especially for the women um, who are bound not just geographically as everybody else is, but also by the constraints of their society. And nature itself is very menacing. You know, I'm thinking of that encounter with the bear. So they have to negotiate this territory much more gingerly than say the men in that society. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, um, it's a fascinating place. And I think in one way unique in all the world, Kamchatka, and another way um, like every other place in the world in that the people are in interplay with an, they're part of an ecosystem and part of um, a world that is not 
not controlled or made entirely by humans, you know, that, that so much of what is around them and affects them and shapes their lives are factors out of their human control. But certainly to me, um, I came to Kamchatka from New York, which is where I'm based. And one of the biggest lessons for me and challenges for me as someone who was um, and is like, you know, not not knowledgeable about a lot of things um, and was very ignorant of what life was like there or what life was like in different places. It was hard to adjust or even accept um, that uh, that without a sort of, I live, I live in a city center in which there is an enormous amount of infrastructure um, and I depend on it so much. I take it for granted so much. I think, yes, when I need to get, gro you know, even in these coronavirus times, when I need to get groceries, there will be food. And when I need to, um, get something from the pharmacy, I can go to the pharmacy and it, it is all there. Whatever I need is there for, you know, if I need to travel from one place to the, uh, the next, there are roads, there are cars, there's subway, it's all there. And it was a real um, education for me to be on Kamshak and understand that those, that the safety net of the state or the safety net of the, um, just like a structure there is, is far from common, the experience of having that safety net. And so people have to create that safety net for each other. And when they don't, there are a lot of cracks that you can slip through. Yeah, um, that was very clear in your writing of the book. And also, despite the menace, and this is what you're saying about people being there for each other, um, that despite the menace, despite the threats, despite um, everything, there are so many stories of tenderness and love that you bring out, you know, love in all its varieties. So, um, that makes me so happy about that. Well, that makes me really, really happy. I, I, um, I don't want the, I don't want my writing to be something ever that when someone puts it down, they feel a dour or hopeless or like the world isn't um, beautiful. Uh, and I think that what I, read for certainly and what I, I chase in my writing and I'm curious how, how you are in your own writing that or your approach to it is that I want to read work that both reflects reality you know makes me feel um gives me the feeling of, of recognition of like yes that is what it is to be alive I understand better now what it is to be alive mm -hmm. um in all of its hurt and um, pain and, and out of controlness. And also in all of its um, beauty and push towards survival and push toward connection, that, that all of those things are there and that I can feel seen in the hurt and also hopeful for the healing. That, that is something that I really hope that the book gives to people because it's, it's something I want a lot from the books I read. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like those two words that always reverberate in my mind with um, E.M. Forster, only connect. And mm. I think in these times of isolation, we realize how, how much we let that go sometimes. But in the end, that's what, that's what really matters. So one of the things that, as a writer, um, absolutely fascinated and intrigued by is the structure of your book. It is so um, brilliant. You know, it starts uh, in August with the abduction of these children from the beach. And every succeeding month, it gets colder and colder. And I practically had chill blains, you know, just holding the book. But at the same time, while each month and, and an extra, um, Part with New Year's, 
while each month is progressing, is self-contained with its stories, you still feel this undercurrent, this tug of the time that's elapsing since the girls were taken and the further you get from it, you know, the more the, the um, disquiet grows. So the question for you as a writer about structure, did you come up with the structure of the months first and then say these stories fit in? Or did the stories come first and later on you came up with this interior architecture for the book? I, everything you're saying makes me so happy, Mamta. I feel like you're really giving me everything that I could, you're giving me every kindness I could possibly crave. It just makes me so happy. Um, I came up with the structure it was one of the first things that I decided on that there would be that, that we would have a year in the life that we would start with the girl's disappearance and that we would have a year in the life of this community. Um, and that the book would kind of be shaped around this disappearance, but that we would have these, that with every subsequent month, we would sort of see, as you said, with this stone dropped in the pond, like more and more of the ripples outward. Um, I had I decided that very early because I had had a previous experience working on a manuscript that was um, I, just gently I'll say like less rigorously shaped or or more formless and I thought that as I worked on it more and more it would sort of coalesce into a whole and it never did and I worked on it for quite a long time and queried agents with it really aggressively, had this idea that this would be my first published novel, which I'm really glad it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, it was a, such a great experience because after I put it away, finally, I had made several decisions about how I wanted to approach the next project. And one of those was I want to have a very firm structuring idea from the start. Um, I want to have a, a sort of a rigid decision about how to shape the work. Um, so I did that. And, and so I had decided that, you know, that there's going to be 13 chapters that like, it's going to, this is how it's going to work. Um, this is where we're going to start. This is where we're going to end. And that ended up being really helpful throughout. Mm -hmm. I funnily enough, when I was working on it, I didn't call the chapters by the months that they were, which is in the published book, they're, mm -hmm they're by chapter. When I was working on, I called each chapter by the name of the woman who was the focus character in each chapter. Okay. And it was only after working on the manuscript for maybe three years, quite, quite a, quite a good bit of time, um, that I thought, I think my, in, I think my editor and I realized like, oh, we can call them by the months. And that created so, just changing the name of the chapters created so much more moment, momentum and a through line and this feeling of a ticking clock. It was like the easiest edit and such a joy, such a huge difference came out of it. You know, sometimes it's that one little thing which makes everything drop into place. You, you just think, how, how could it happen? But it does. I, wouldn't it be great if everything was like that? It was so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> right. My life is entirely like that. Completely in place. Just drop it into place. <laughs> but, you know, even though you said that you, your twin interests were like English and Russian and you, you were very lucky you were able to combine both in your first um, novel, clearly you didn't set out to write a Russian novel. Right. You weren't writing in that tradition. So what, what tradition do you feel that you situated yourself in when writing it? That's a really great question. I certainly, if it comes to national traditions, mm -hmm. my, um, my literary education, my reading, my, um, idols you know that the the heroes that i try to emulate it's american literature and um canadian literature i would say to to some extent as well so like north american mm -hmm. literature when i think about the writers who i am trying to be like or the 
whenever I talk about this book, I think about um, Alice Monroe for me and uh, Louise Erdrich are, are two authors that I just, every single one of their works that I read, I think, oh, that is what, that's what it's for. That's what writing is for. That's what art is for. This is what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the point of, of art making. And that excitement, I think, is what fueled this project and makes me determined and, and dream of keeping on writing. Um, to, I, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, please. you said Alice Monroe, it, it struck something for me. You know, I'm thinking, again, um, small town very rigid um, social customs, very deeply ingrained, but women with very complicated desires. So yeah, I, and, I and a, real, a real honoring of those is I, I, I hadn't, when I first read her, I was coming out of a period in my reading where I, I, was reading very few women. I was reading very few contemporary authors. Mm-hmm. Um, I was reading a lot of like mid-century white guys. <laughs> and, um, and I wasn't willing to recognize um, like or honor that what a story could be if it wasn't a, a mid-century white guy um, writing about his his or a similar experience. Um, And I remember reading Alice Munro, a bunch of her books and thinking like, who cares? You know, like just not, not getting it, not like not being willing to get it, not understanding at all. And then going back a couple of years later and, and being able to see and having my mind blown by the, um, the way that she, I keep thinking of the word honors, but really honors the experiences of her characters' lives and, and the smallest moments and how she communicates to the reader, this is important, this matters. Um, it, it might look small from the outside, but it's the biggest thing that has ever happened to this person and that, that matters immensely. And that taught me so much. I think honoring is such a such a big equation um, of writing. You know, you don't always choose the stories. Some stories choose you um, when you write them. And all you can do is honor the story that has been given to you to tell. And um, I know that when I, I'm clearly not French, but I wrote about Paris. You're clearly not Russian. You write about Kamchatka. So what was it? like for you, the outsider's perspective? This is something that I thought, that I thought a lot about while I was working on the book. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm thinking about it more and learning about it more now Mm. all the time. I don't know if you're like, it's like my changing, my thinking on it has, keeps on changing so much as as time goes on, I'm so curious about what your experience has been and what, what your thoughts are. I, I thought <laughs> this is true culturally for me as an outsider. And it was also, it, it held true for me as, uh, as, a, as an artist. It was helpful for me to think it for both, mm-hmm. to understand, to acknowledge to myself from the jump, like this, I, I'm going to try something for my own um, education and growth and uh, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to stretch myself in a way that is designed to fail. So I'm going to try to tell this story um, mm-hmm. that is not my story and that no matter how much research I put into it or how much time I put into it, will never be my story. It's not ever going to be a story that I'm never going to be Russian. I'm never going to be a native speaker. I'm never going, I could live in Kamchatka for the rest of my life and, and still never, I'll always be an outsider. 
Um, and all my characters are insiders. There's not a character in my book who is an, an American journalist or something coming to, and, and so from, so it was really helpful to me to think from the start and to remind myself every time, um, I don't know if I'll be able to perceive clearly or write clearly or um, tell a story that resonates with the people with that, that I want it to resonate with, or I don't know if I'll be able to do any of that. All of it might not work at all. And still it is worthwhile um, to me to try and to try to do better and to try to learn and to, to do my best. And if my best doesn't work for me or for anyone else, that is, that's okay. There's, that's okay. Um, well, it did work. Happen. You know, <laughs> I mean, like every every reader's experience is objective. <laughs> I love you said you're setting yourself up to fail. I mean, I'm just wondering how it would be if you set yourself up to succeed. <laughs> it's like it's like working out of your out of your comfort zone in a in a way that I think is so helpful for us as writers too, right? Like you, you're yeah. biting off more than you can chew of saying, okay, I'm going to try to do something that um, that I know is beyond my abilities, and I'm going to do my best at it, and and that's worthwhile, even if what happens is that like, you know, I try to lift this weight and it falls on top of me. And I think <laughs> that was way too much. I should have never tried to, that was like, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that's okay. I don't know, how did, you, how did you think of it? How do you think of it? Well, um, you know, it, it was, I had written other books, like, just like you. Um, the the uh, debut novel is not necessarily my first written novel, just my yeah. first published novel. And I had written about India, I had written about Miami, yeah. and then I decided, and now for something completely different, as Monty Python puts it, and um, in a way, it allows you the freedom um, to write in a way that you might not have written yourself about um, this kind of situation in America or me, um, but it gives you the distance and the purchase on the material, I felt. But I, I want to go back to you and just say, you know how Byron said that I woke up one morning and found myself famous. So what has this wild ride of a year been like for you? Um, I, I haven't yet woken up in the morning and found myself famous. I, think. I, like, I like that, that I'll, I'll wait for a Byron-esque experience in that, as in all things. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been, uh, I mean, it's, it's been the most wonderful um, and challenging year. It's it's been extraordinary, and I I realized, um, you know, there's like this social media. The part of the job is is um, working on uh, promoting oneself or like preparing material to sort of. Not, not every author has to do it by any means. And some authors are incredible at it, but like by, I try to practice being on social media. And, and I realized um, that I would write these posts on social media and I, I, I would say the same thing over and over again. And if I, I had to kind of back off posting for a while because I kept on saying like, this is such a dream. This is such a dream. When will I wake up? It's so dreamy. Everything's so dreamy. Like what a dream, what a dream come true. This is just the dream of my life. It's just a dream come true. And after a while it began to be like, feel a little bit like, like, am I in a dream? Is this real? <laughs> like I had a tenor of, um, <laughs> of uh, like, thinking about debut writers who are sitting there slashing their wrists every time they hear you say that and you go back off back off well absolutely that and also it, it was a helpful thing to recognize like when what am i talking when i say this is a dream what am i talking about i that that a lot of what i'm talking about is like this feels um like an this is so much the experience of being able to go into a bookstore and see my book on the shelf is a fantasy I've had my entire life. It's mm -hmm. been a very robust fantasy. It has been like the overriding, <laughs> think about every second, every, every first star I ever saw, I'd wish on it. You know, like this was the fantasy. It was so consuming. 
um, mm. so consuming. And now this far in to the dream of this year, it is hard. It has been hard to accept that that fantasy is a reality and the fantasy feeling continues in a way that is, that feels um, very fake. So it feels like almost like a, I'm like, oh, it, it's truly like a dream where you are walking around in your dream world and you're like, I know this isn't real, but I, I guess I'll just accept it. And you know that at any moment the bubble will pop and you'll wake up and it'll all be over. Um, and that, that air of unreality is, uh, is both comforting and distressing. It's, it's clearly like a coping mechanism that's kind of a problem. <laughs> and um, yeah. it was very interesting. It's very well, interesting. I read, I think in something you had written for, um, I forget now, The Millions maybe, that you, you also uh, became pregnant last year. Yes, so. I'm in my third trimester now. Wow. So imagine having your book baby and a real baby in the same span of 12 months. So you can keep pinching yourself and may the flesh and blood baby have the kind of launch that your paper and words baby has had. I and hope it'll be, I hope it'll be a little faster with the, with the flesh and blood baby. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not editing as much as you go along. I hope. I hope. Be a little, relinquish a little control. <laughs> For those of you who are looking forward to reading this book, please buy it from your local independent bookstore. I thank you. Julia Phillips thanks you. I and thank I you. Thank Julia Phillips <laughs> for being here for this conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Mm -hmm.